I am now reading you an arrest warrant. Why? Be quiet. I'm reading you an arrest warrant. Do you hear me? Law enforcement is in progress. Did I commit murder or arson? No, but you violated the law. What law did I violate? The law of civil disputes. Don't act as if you don't care. I'm not indifferent. I just want to know what's going on. You are violating the law by not paying off your debts. Let me interrupt you. You are arresting me in a public place like this, and people might think I murdered someone or set a fire. I am reading you the warrant. You can't interrupt. Recently, police across China have begun what appears to be a unified campaign to arrest people who owe money. There is very little media coverage of this operation in China. Only news stories like this one are seen on major websites. It says that a man who owed 170 million yuan, or approximately 23 million U.S. dollars, was pursued by the courts. The man was involved in a private loan dispute. After the court order, the man never complied and did not pay what was owed. On June 23, 2023, at 5 a.m., two levels of court enforcement officers, bailiffs and notaries from Chengdu, Sichuan province, a total of over 40 people, went to the man's residence to make an arrest and seize the man's home possessions. The various details of this video indicate that the arrested individual doesn't appear to have owed a huge amount of money, but is probably a small average debtor. His case is probably more in line with the following inconspicuous news. In May 2023, two levels of courts and enforcement officers across Henan province joined forces to go around and arrest borrowers who were delinquent in their payments. One city deployed a total of eight police vehicles and 51 enforcement officers in a coordinated enforcement operation. The report said, after a continuous nine-hour battle, 12 persons were detained, two arrested, three cases closed, five cases settled, and debt repayments totaling 35,000 yuan were enforced. 35,000 yuan, or US $4,000, is a very small amount. In other words, 14 people were arrested to settle a debt of US 4,000. It shows that the amount owed by each debtor isn't much. When divided by 14 people, the amount owed on average is roughly US $286. In another city in Henan province, one news report said, A special enforcement action detained 12 people and executed cases worth more than 300,000 yuan or more than US 40,000. When spread over 12 people, each owes an average of more than US 3,300. The most successful case is one by the Feng Cheng Court. Its centralized enforcement action summoned 21 people, arrested two, closed 14 cases, and enforced an amount of U.S. 137,000, which is equivalent to about U.S. 19,000 per individual. Why are the courts and police suddenly enthusiastic about civil disputes over loans? The headline of the news reads, Helping enterprises alleviate their difficulties and solve livelihood problems. It seems that the Chinese government is troubled by the debt problem and worried about the difficulties of enterprises. Or perhaps the government and the judiciary are trying to deter people from defaulting on their debts. So, do the Chinese courts and police deserve credit for this action? Can they do their part to solve China's debt problem? Let's look at the debt crisis facing the Red Regime. The Wall Street Journal recently reported that Chinese companies, people, and local governments have been borrowing heavily for years, with a total credit from non-financial institutions of about US $50 trillion. That revenue is now being used to pay off debt rather than to spend or invest, which will weigh heavily on China's economic growth for a long time to come. China has been borrowing for years to fund everything from cross-sea bridges to new residential projects, and has now reached what economists refer to as the long deleveraging phase, where revenues are used to pay off debt rather than being spent on consumption or investment. 
According to the Bank for International Settlements (BIS), China's non-financial sector credit totaled U.S. 49.9 trillion in September 2022, more than three times what it was 10 years ago. BIS data also showed that China's total debt to gross domestic product (GDP) was 295 percent in September of 2022, exceeding the U.S. total debt to GDP of 257 percent and the eurozone total debt to GDP average of 258 percent. The Wall Street Journal report pointed out that China's central government debt is relatively low as a percentage of GDP. And this debt comes mainly from households, private enterprises, and local governments. Marco Papik, chief strategist at asset management firm Clock Tower Group, said the Chinese household's debt is now nearly 110 percent of disposable income, which is close to the level of U.S. household debt around the time of the global financial crisis. The Chinese government's relaxation of anti-epidemic measures was expected to boost the economy through domestic spending. But so far, people haven't spent much. Despite the low interest rates in China, people are eager to pay off their mortgages. Also, people now save up cash instead of borrowing in response to heavy debt. The Chinese government is also concerned about the lack of action by businesses. According to official Chinese data, private investment in China grew by only 0.4 percent in the first four months of 2023, compared to the same period last year. According to the statistics of the China Index Research Institute, the area of land sold in 300 cities in China in the first five months of 2023 decreased by 26 percent compared to the same period last year. Among them, in the single month of May, the planned area of land transactions in 300 cities dropped by nearly 40 percent year on year, and the amount of land premiums for various types of land was 228.495 billion yuan. Down 70.77 percent year on year. All these show that investment is decreasing. It may seem that the CCP is doing some good for individuals or businesses using coercive measures to solve the problem of private borrowing, targeting small debts ranging from U.S. 200 to 20,000. The question is, who in China wants to go into debt? Let's take a look at the voices of people who have defaulted on their debts. I mean, debt to the tune of U.S. 1.63 million dollars, and those in debt like me probably have trouble sleeping all night too. As a former outstanding businesswoman and the boss of a corporation, I have now become a loser that everyone despises. I feel deeply what it means to live a life that's worse than death, and what it means to spend every day like a year, every waking moment. I'm thinking about how to pay back the money, my children's school fees and living expenses. Where would they come from? I started to invest blindly in 2017. I never thought of the big environment and its impact on me, which is simply beyond me. My projects are exploding all over the place. Bam! I was blown from the sky to the bottom. All my seven houses and all my cars were lost, and all my debts are overdue across the board. They say everyone should go home for the new year, whether they have money or not. But I don't have the chance to go home for the new year. For the first time in my life, I spent the new year alone. After three years of living with a mask, chip shortage, export disruptions, and rising raw material prices, in order to maintain the normal operation of my factory, I tried to tear down the east wall to mend the west wall. Finally, the factory closed down, and I am 830,000 U.S. dollars in debt. I sold everything I could, and now I have nothing left. When I think of the expectant eyes of my elderly parents, I feel a pang in my heart. Other people have family reunions, but I'm in the middle of the tribulation. I used to drive luxury cars and be a boss, but now I'm on the streets. It's early in the morning, and I can't sleep. I can't sleep at night. I'm also closing down my company, and I'm in a particularly tough spot. I really can't stand it anymore. Every day, many people are pressing me for money. You know what? I owe other people. People come to me every day to press me to pay, but I can't get any money back from those who owe me. I now owe three hundred thousand U.S. dollars. Now, a staggering number of people are at risk of having their homes repossessed and being saddled with huge amounts of debt. My friend's home was in foreclosure today, and she was crying on the phone with me. I'm 
very sad for her. I don't know if you've been paying attention to a set of statistics. This year, experts predict that 40 million homes nationwide would miss their mortgage payments. 10 million homes would become foreclosed. Now, whether you have money or not, if you don't really need a home, I suggest you don't buy one. I didn't buy it myself. I was ready to buy in my hometown, Hunan province, two years ago. But when I saw the economy was bad, I didn't buy any. My friend paid 2.4 million yuan, or 330,000 US dollars, for this home and made payments for five years. Now, the foreclosure sale had it sold for 1.8 million yuan, or US $248,000. Not only has she lost her home, she lost all the interest she paid in the past five years, and she still owns the bank 25,000 US dollars. Isn't this tragic? In addition to the huge burden of a mortgage, many other factors push the average family into desperation, such as China's ridiculous health care system. A hospital's one-day turnover is 60 million yuan, or U.S. 8.29 million dollars. Can you imagine that? A few days ago, the hospital affiliated with Zhengzhou University announced in high profile on its website that the turnover of a certain year was more than 3 billion U.S. dollars, which translates into one-day revenue of 8.29 million U.S. dollars. It's almost a money printing machine now. Behind this figure are many Chinese families who have lost all their savings. Among the various revenue streams, the medical examination fee alone is 8.15 million US dollars. It turns out that it isn't the hospital that's poor at curing illnesses, but rather it's looking to make a profit from its patients. Think about it. It's only this one hospital in Zhengzhou. In ancient times, at the entrance of a pharmacy, it was written, wish there were no sickness in the world, rather the medicine on the shelf grows dust. Now, the entrance of the pharmacy says, become a member, buy 10 sets of medicines and receive 5 free, spend over 58 yuan to receive free eggs and so on. In foreign countries, there is a gym every 10 steps, and in our country, there is a drugstore every 10 steps. I hope that in the future, the hospital will measure its performance by the number of patients they have treated in a year, rather than how much money they have made in a year. It's foreseeable that under the economic recession and unemployment wave sweeping China, more and more defaults will emerge, and more people won't be able to carry their payments and will become deadbeats on the government credit list. Yesterday, I saw a middle-aged man cry for two minutes. He was in tears because he read an article that probably struck his nerve. The article said that when you see people with computers and iPads in Starbucks, and they seem to be talking about work, but they are actually looking for work. They are usually over 35 years old. They have reached a certain age, but are unemployed and afraid to go home. When they go home, they have to face their wives and children and their entire families. With the enormous amount of pressure, where else can they go? They go to Starbucks, bring their cell phones and laptops, and pretend they're working. In reality, it's a bunch of unemployed middle-aged men busy looking for employment information. Many economists believe that the Chinese government has sufficient financial resources to prevent a fiscal crisis or recession. Is this really the case? Dr. Cheng Xiaonang, an expert on China affairs and economist, has researched the approximate figures of China's local debt. On February 27, 2023, he wrote for Radio Free Asia that according to China's public figures, the local government debt balance at the end of 2022 was as high as US $4.8 trillion. Adding more hidden debt, China's local debt would have reached about $12 trillion by the end of 2020. Thus, adding the three trillion debt of the central government, the total debt of both the central and local governments in China is RMB 110 trillion, or about US 15 trillion, equivalent to 91% of China's GDP. It's significantly above the internationally recognized 60% threshold. 
According to this doctor, it's simply impossible for local governments in China to pay off their debts. Dr. Cheng points out that if the huge debt problem isn't solved, China will face a comprehensive and extremely grave economic disaster. That is to say, the various levels of the government of the CCP regime have already spent and wasted almost all of China's wealth over the past few years. Will the new government, organized by Xi Jinping's cronies, be able to do anything about the troubled Chinese economy? Most economists don't think so. For local governments, they simply can't break out of the pattern of borrowing new debt to pay off old debt. The largest pool at present to borrow for new debt is people's savings, which totaled US$16.6 trillion at the end of 2022, while the debt balance of the central and local governments is US$15.2 trillion. Based on our observations of the nature of the CCP regime, there is a high probability that most of the savings of the Chinese people will be taken by local governments to pay off their debts, leaving individual banks with IOUs that will never be honored. Already from the second half of 2022, the phenomena of depositors not being able to withdraw their deposits is happening one after another in many Chinese banks. It's likely that local governments have moved people's deposits. This is the entrance of a construction bank in Henan province where people are holding up banners saying that their money has been embezzled by the bank. <sighs> Yuzhou Construction Bank of Henan Province deceived depositors, return my hard-earned money. Money can't be retrieved. Return my hard-earned money. Return my hard-earned money. What the bank did was to call in the police to maintain social stability, so to speak. Chinese people now need to be especially careful with banks and the various types of financial products they have recommended. Just like the saying widely circulated on the Chinese web, you are attracted by the interests offered by others. Others are scheming your principal. I bought six gold bars 10 years ago and deposited them in the Jin Jin platform of China Gold. But now I can't take them out. Isn't this infuriating? Miss Fang from Hangzhou City, Zhejiang Province, bought six gold bars at China Gold's flagship store in Hangzhou 10 years ago and spent 24,000 US dollars. At that time, she signed a custody agreement with China Gold to take out the physical gold in 24 months. When Miss Fang went to pick them up upon the due date, the staff in the store recommended recommended another platform for storing gold, which can be viewed on a mobile app, which is very convenient and safe. In addition, it has about 50 grams of appreciation every year. It's an app called Jing Yujing Financial Management, which serves gold investment, provides secure transactions, buys gold online, and now stores gold. So Ms. Fang stored her gold on the platform. She could see the appreciation in value every year on her phone. During the epidemic, she saw that 600 grams of gold became 800 grams, worth 34,000 US dollars, and she was very happy. However, when Ms. Fang was about to take out her gold, the platform wouldn't open. She kept it the business card given by the staff at that time. On the business card, there were two logos of China Gold and Jin Yujing. Both businesses were owned by the same boss, but no one answered the phone call and the store was already closed. In the video, the woman who bought the gold probably didn't notice some inconspicuous corporate notices, so she didn't take out the gold until after the epidemic. In reality, as early as 2019, before the epidemic, the financial platform called Jin Yu Jin was already in trouble. China Gold Group is a wholly state-owned enterprise in China, and the company in Zhejiang Province is its subsidiary. The company in Zhejiang Province has been selling Jin Yu Jin financial products for five years. The whole process wasn't a secret. The Jin Yu Jin platform company was registered in 2015, launched in 2016, and marketed under the China Gold brand since then. It was completely transparent and open. The outside publicity followed the same approach. Customers came to the platform because they trusted China Gold as a state-owned enterprise. But China Gold Group issued a notice later requesting its subsidiary in Zhejiang to stop the operation because it used the China Gold brand to conduct a legal custodian business, and it seriously damaged the brand image.
In other words, China Gold claimed that it had no idea that its subsidiary in Zhejiang was operating the Jinyu Jin Wealth Management products. This state-owned enterprise group has shrugged off its responsibility with a single notice. It can be said that in China, from the central to local governments, from state-owned enterprises to private companies, there are too many traps set for ordinary folks. Those who are in desperate straits and can't repay their debts are also victims of this system. Now the CCP has launched Operation Thunderbolt, in which large numbers of police officers are deployed to arrest people who have defaulted on their debts and to humiliate them in public or the community. Unfortunately, this tactic of forcing people to pay back or scaring the public has very little practical value in addressing systemic problems. Other countries are experiencing the slowing down of economic growth due to debt repayment. In Japan, for example, the housing bubble burst in the 1980s and 90s, and even though interest rates fell to zero, companies and people simply paid off their debts without borrowing. It subsequently reduced demand and led to a vicious cycle of deflation and economic stagnation. The subprime mortgage crisis in the U.S. in the 2000s led to years of deleveraging, putting pressure on consumption and economic growth. China has already fallen into the situation where even zero interest rates fail to stimulate the economy. Perhaps Western scholars would advise, for example, that Chinese policymakers should take a lesson from Japan and encourage more debt restructuring and direct income support to households to boost consumption. Such a professional exercise would be too difficult for the Chinese government. The government has come up with many solutions such as implementing a real estate tax, delaying the retirement age, and reducing the rebate to individuals and health insurance. But they have all been met with great resistance from the public. In the past few months, people have taken to the streets to protest in cities such as Dalian, Wuhan, and Guangzhou. That is, in the face of the CCP's new policies, people have either taken to the streets and protested, or they have stopped buying Social Security, and many self-employed freelancers are now refusing to buy Social Security. Of course, there are a small number of people in Red China who are incredibly wealthy. They are the elite and powerful and the cornerstone of the CCP regime. Chinese judges and police officers will never hit these people when they orchestrate Operation Thunderbolt. Thank you.